life in 1939. Well, we can get into some simple things like costs. The average cost of a new ha house would be about $3,800. If you translate that into modern 2019 dollars, that is 90, roughly $67,000. So if it's a good house, you're probably doing better back then in terms of what you can buy for a house. Certainly you'd be doing much better if that was the cost on the coasts. Average wages were about $1,730, and today, if you translated that into modern dollars, would be about $31,000. If you compare this against the United States median income at this point, which is thirty-two dollars to $33,000, that's not far off. The cost of a gallon of gas was $0.10, cents, which translated to $2019 is $1.76. So clearly at that point, you would be doing better in terms of gas. The average cost for house rent was $28 per month. If you translate that to $2019, that's about 500 bucks. To rent a decent house, one that would have a family in it, which is what they're talking about here, obviously you can't do that with 500 bucks. A loaf of bread cost eight cents, which today would translate to one dollar and forty-nine. A one-pound hamburger meat would cost fourteen cents. A pound of that, if you translated that into modern dollars, that's two dollars and forty-seven cents. Price of a new car was around seven hundred bucks, but translated into modern dollars, that would be about twelve thousand. So depending on what you get, kind of a wash. This one's interesting. A toaster of that time period would cost sixteen dollars. Now in 2019 dollars, that is $281.74. And believe it or not, the cost of that had been cut significantly in the last 10 years because this was the time when they were starting to run electricity everywhere. So they had more electricity, more customers, and then things like electric appliances like a toaster would come out. As with all technology, the toaster was at first very expensive. I mean, 280 bucks for a toaster. It was first very expensive, but then as more manufacturers got into it, they were manufacturing things with a, a lower cost and higher quality. That's what always happens with any kind of technology. Start out with it being really expensive, but as people start to get into the game, it becomes lower and lower and the quality goes up and up. That's just the way it always works. Hot cross buns were 16 cents per dozen. Today that translates into $2.82. And you could get four cans of Campbell's tomato soup for 25 cents. Today that would be $4.40. Now there was the Great Depression, which was still underway in 1939. Ten years, I would mention, after it began in 1929. In the United States, employment, unemployment was around 17.2%, and amazingly, they list um, inflation at 0%. Hard to imagine that that was actually true, but the, as I said, the, the Great Depression began in 1929 and would not end until after World War II. So think about this, an entire generation of people in the United States grew up knowing nothing but economic hardship. They took it for granted. Now, in terms of some, a parallel that I can talk about, in terms of what we have come to just expect, we have 96 million people in this country who are unemployed, but we do not count them as unemployed. And we are now used to, because this has been going on so long, a generation or more, we are simply used to now the now constant homeless people on the streets and encampments around the United States, particularly Southern California because of the weather. I have a friend, a very big globe-trotting friend, who goes, has gone and still goes everywhere, and I don't mean the tourist traps. I mean he goes out there and some of the bad places he goes to. Well, he tells me, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, because he has been to a lot of dren holes in his time, I have to admit that when he says it looks like a third world country, I have to believe him. And we, having seen this for so long, and so many people who are out of work chronically, that we're used to it. We are just used to seeing the homeless encampments. 
President Roosevelt's New Deal and a lot of his other socialist programs probably extended the Great Depression by at least five years and perhaps ten, and their effects are still with us today. So, for example, in 1940, they started military spending. They took taxes and government deficit spending and began heavily, in, heavily investing in the military. They started drafting millions of young men that year, 1940, which was one year before the U.S. got into the war. By 1945, the end of the war, they had 17 million people in the uh, armed forces, but that was still not enough to absorb all the unemployed. Now, during the war, taxes and deficit spending subsidized wages through cost-plus contracts. What a cost-plus contract was is that government contractors were paid in full for their costs, plus a certain percentage profit margin. Now, that meant that the more wages a person was paid, that would mean that the expense would go up, and the company would then profit higher. And again, the, the taxes and deficit spending would cover these new costs plus a percentage. So as the percentage of people they got went up and their wages went up, their percentage of a profit went up. Using these uh, cost plus benefits in 1941 and 1943, uh, industrial places hired uh, thousands of unskilled workers and trained them, again, subsidized via taxes and government deficit spending. This taxpayer fleecing and deficit spending set the example for all taxpayer fleecing to come. And the government deficit spending set the example for generations continuing up to the present day. It is now so ingrained and so normal that only libertarians can even imagine a nation without it. And his policies extended the Great Depression during Depression for years. Roosevelt was not a good president. He was a socialist with communist leanings who made things far, far worse economically. And he drove the final nail into the coffin of the U.S. Constitution. Now, President Lincoln had pretty much killed it, but Roosevelt pounded the last nail into that coffin. Then President Johnson just completely buried the coffin, and every politician since has been doing nothing but simply pissing on the Constitution's grave. We have not had a constitutional republic since Roosevelt was elected, and this is evidenced by the 99.9999999999% of things that the federal government does that are flatly unconstitutional by any sane reading of that document. In terms of events, oh man, big one here, Germany. On September 1st, Germany invaded Poland. At that point, France, Australia, and the UK, who are allies of Poland, declared war on Germany. And this was the start of World War I. Germany and Italy also signed the Pact of Steel, which resulted in Italy being Germany's ally in World War II. And there was an assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler that failed by eight minutes. Can you imagine what modern history would look like if that eight minutes hadn't been a problem, if they'd actually killed Hitler at that point? In the UK, the outbreak of World War II stopped all television broadcasting by the BBC, and it would not be resumed until after the war in 1946. In Finland, Soviet troops invaded Finland. Uh, the Soviet Union then lost over 125,000 men as compared to the 25,000 that Finland Watch lost. There were also nearly 200,000 injuries on the Soviet side, where Finland had about 43,000. This result made the, uh, the West lose confidence in the USSR's military, uh, and they were about to go to World War II with them. And it gave the Nazi, Nazis in Germany confidence against its enemies as the Second World War began. They said, oh, the Russians screwed the pooch. That's not so bad. We're going to have a good time at this. Other places, Spain. Generalissimo Francisco Franco was not dead. He was the dictator of Spain at this time. 
And in this year, he conquered Madrid, ending the Spanish Civil War. And in that same year, an earthquake killed 30,000 people in Spain. In France, the last public ex execution was held when the murderer Eugene Wildman was decapitated by the guillotine. Yes, they were using the guillotine all the way up until at least 1939. That is how the French roll. <laughs> In the Middle East, the UK Royal Commission recommended the formation of Arab and Jewish states, and the Palestinians revolted. This is how long we've been stuck in that quagmire over there, at least since 1939, and in fact back to World War I, when the colonial powers divided up that area uh, into places that nobody in it wanted to live. So we have this thing where we're going to have uh, a Jewish state, which became Israel, next to the Palestinians who hate them. What a shock. And, of course, this year in Rome, Pope Pius XI died. In the U.S., the Neutrality Acts were amended so that we could send military aid to countries in Europe while still officially neutral in the war. Does this sound at all consistent with what we do now. It should. In October of 1939, President Roosevelt received a letter from Albert Einstein indicating that probably nuclear fission was possible and with great energy release. And so later they set up the Manhattan Project to do precisely that, to create a bomb based on nuclear fission and was used twice. Also this year, Lou Gehrig retired from Major League Baseball after being diagnosed with ALS, and LaGuardia Airport opened in New York City. In terms of popular culture, in terms of TV, well, uh, not a hell of a lot. Regular broadcasts had just started. There really wasn't much going on in TV. In the film world, Gone with the Wind had come out, The Wizard of Oz, Stagecoach of Mice and Men, Wuthering Heights, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. In music, Glenn Miller had a series of hits, including Mar Moonlight Serenade. Other pro songs that were very popular, Moon Love, Over the Rainbow, which comes from uh, Wizard of Oz and sung by Judy Carland, Starway to the Stars, and Address Unknown by the Ink Spots. In other things, in the U.S., the World's Fair opened in New York City, and the very first air-conditioned car went on show. That year, Hewlett Packard was also formed, HP. Notable births in that period of time, John Cleese, Tina Turner, Marvin Gaye, Francis Ford Coppola, George Hamilton, the Ayatollah Khomeini, Lee Majors, and Lee Harvey Oswald. So, in terms of fashions, what you might find yourself wearing at that time. This is a pretty good example of that. This is where men are wearing suits. That was something that went through all the way through the 1960s, even some people into the early 1970s if you were conservative. Men always wore suits of a kind that you're seeing here. If you walk down the street, this is what you would see. Now, these guys are wearing something upscale that's brand new. The average person who had very little money because of the Depression had clothes that looked a little more worn than this. However, this is what you were expected to wear. A suit, tie, and a hat. The hat, in fact, was a holdover. Um, it was a, something that was only for men. You, you didn't wear them as a child. You didn't wear them as a teenager. Wearing a hat was indicative that you were an adult. And this hat is largely a holdover, by the way, from the medieval period with knights and so forth where they had, you know, helmets. Uh, it slowly sort of turned back into a hat. And so the hat became symbolic of a number of things, one of which I'm going to talk about in a minute. If you were a woman, this is what you could probably expect to be wearing. Let me check something real quick. I want to see what I've got. Okay, I'm good and public. All right. Uh, th this is what you would see a woman wearing, this type of dress. Pretty straight, you know, kind of conservative. Interesting thing about this dress is this is what was called a uh, feedback. Fe I'm sorry, feedback dress. 
Um, this one's not really feed bag dresses. This is modeled, however, on that style. Women of that period, and uh, way up until the 1970s, in that for that matter, and still some today, as you know, sort of a, a niche thing. But back then, women made all the clothes. They made their dresses. They made you know, sewed up everything. What they would do is they would get a pattern. They'd buy a pattern or borrow it from someone, and then they would use that to make the dress. What they found, however, was because they were so poor, was that you could take feed sacks, you know, sacks where that would be delivering uh, feed grain, feed corn to animals. And when they're empty, washed out, you could use them as a dress. And so that's what happened. And that's why even the upscale dresses like you're seeing here, even those things were, you know, pretty straight. You could see those being feed, feed sack dresses. So. One thing I'm going to do mention is the date experience in 1939. If you were going on a date, here's how it would go. The man would show up at the woman's place of residence, whether it was a house or a boarding house, which they had quite a lot of. He would show up there in a car or something like that, or perhaps a cab that he'd gotten for the purpose, because not everybody had cars. And he would be wearing what we kind of saw him wearing here, and he would pick up the woman. Uh, she might not be wearing something like this. She might be wearing something a little bit more ornate, but, you know, this was the style. He would pick her up at her home, and then when they went to the car, it was, what I'm about to describe to you, was absolutely socially expected at this time. If you didn't do it, if a man didn't do these things, he was considered a cad. If a woman didn't do these things, she might be considered a slut. So the man would then open the door of the car or the cab for the woman. And he would allow her to sit down and seat herself and get her clothes all inside the car. And then he would close the car doors. He would then go around to the other side and get in. They would then arrive at wherever they're supposed to be. And he would get out, go around the car, and then open the door and typically take the woman's hand in order to help her out of the car and then close the door. Walking down the street, there was something prescribed for that. Walking down the street, a man would always stand on this side that was closest to the street. The notion being, it was a, it was a symbolic uh, show of protection. The notion was that if something came by, splashed up uh, stuff off of the pavement, it would hit the uh, guy and not the woman in her rather expensive stuff. When you got to the movie theater, the man would hold the door for the woman, absolutely. And then as walking into the theater and walking towards the seating, the man would take up a position on the woman's right side. The reason for that was the right side was considered the side of honor. And it was because in old days, you would have a knight with a sword, and he would need to draw this sword and use this arm to be uh, doing fighting. So the woman was always on the man's left, so that she would be out of the way and protected when he's doing his fighting. Obviously, they didn't do that in 1939, but the, uh, the uh, required social interaction was there. You had to do that. Once you got to the seats, the man would go first. He would clear the aisle for the woman and uh, then find some seats. And the woman would sit down. And only after she was fully seated and everything was good, then he would sit down and remove his hat. Now, this was, again, a symbolic show of protection. You're saying to the woman, I'm going to leave my helmet on until I know that it is perfectly safe. When it comes to what you did after the movie, uh, the movie by itself, by the way, was not the same experience we have now. There would be a newsreel, a couple of cartoons, maybe a short subject, and then two films. You would have a film that was run first, usually higher quality, that you called the A film. And then you'd have a second film running that was usually not quite as good quality, either technically or in terms of what it was, and that would be the B movie. And that is where we get the uh, B-movie term from. Today, movies we call B-movies aren't really B-movies. You know, technically speaking, a B-movie is just the second movie in the bunch. But that's where that comes from, B-movies.
So that was life in that period. And again, after the, uh, after the, after the movie's over and you're headed home, men, I must tell you, you weren't getting none. Uh, women generally tended to be virgins until they were married. If they weren't, they got a reputation as a slut, and that's really all they did. They had a lot of sex. Um, and being a slut was very shameful at the time, extremely shameful. It was not non-shameful to be a slut until the early 2000s. Before that time, a woman who was a slut was very looked down on by everyone. And in fact, at this period of time, if people knew that you were a slut, that meant that you would be spit on on the streets by older women. Just the way it worked. You think slut shaming is bad now? Go back to 1939. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing the control and manipulation of minds.